everybody, and welcome back to Leading Entrepreneurs of the World. I'm Stelios Katsaki, CEO of One Business World. The Leading Entrepreneurs of the World series is a digital informational and educational series of presentations by leading entrepreneurs, investors, and advisors. Our goal is to provide the global business and entrepreneurial communities with a window into the minds of those who are shaping the future of the world. Today, we're very pleased to welcome leading entrepreneur, speaker, and author, Chris Dyer. Chris is the founder and CEO of People G2, a fully remote organization. People G2 is routinely ranked one of the best places to work and has been listed as one of Inc.'s 5,000 fastest growing companies five times. At People G2, Chris and his team offer proven, scalable, high impact, and legally defensible business solutions for companies and human resource departments, executive leadership teams, business investors, corporate restructuring, and M&A architects. Drawing on the military intelligence gathering term G2, People G2 proactively and systematically conducts discovery on both the potential sources of value and potential concerns that accompany human capital assets. The company has consistently set itself apart from the industry's highly commoditized excessively automated background check, check service providers by focusing on each customer's unique business needs and being flexible, hands-on provider to their clients. As a leadership speaker, Chris's goal is to inspire audiences with a straightforward delivery, insightful candor, and engaging humor. His talks leave audiences permanently transformed, offering innovative perspectives on leadership to improve company culture and empower organizations to, to discover new success. Countless are the companies that have unlocked productivity, performance, and profits by implementing the strategies from Chris's talks, webinars, and books. Speaking of books, his first, The Power of Company Culture, was a bestseller. And his second, due this May, in a couple of weeks from now, titled Remote Work, is also expected to quickly become a bestseller too. Chris, it is a great pleasure and an honor to have you here with us today to hear more on the five secrets of remote success. Thank you and welcome to Leading Entrepreneurs of the World. Well, thank you so much for having me and I'll uh, share my screen and we'll get going here. I'm excited to, to share uh, a little bit about my company, uh, my journey, and of course, what are the five secrets to remote success? What are the initial five things you got to get right? You got to do if you want to have a good remote company, a good remote team, hot you, this works as well for hybrid as, uh, as a strategy. And so there are some really key things that we can think about and begin to design. And what's nice about this is these are things that you can take back to your organization and figure out how to make it work for you. Um, these aren't so specific that you have to do this one thing, this one way, or it'll ne never work. So let's go ahead and, and dive into a little bit. And I want to start this talk off with uh, maybe a, a little little idea here of having you all think about what if. And, and what if tomorrow you were going to start a brand new job at your, at your current company, except you weren't going to be you, you were going to be somebody else. And on day one, you don't know, we're going to roll a dice, we're just going to keep rolling dice, and we're going to decide what your name will be. We're going to decide what your gender identity will be. We're going to roll a dice and come up with what your sexual identity might be, your racial identity, your ethnic. Identity. We're, we're going to, you have no control over any of this. It's all going to be completely random. Do you think your company today is adequately prepared for you under any circumstance, right? Maybe your uh, disability status, maybe your physical uh, ability to be able to do a job, all these different types of things. And I often ask this question of people and they, they think about it and they go, you know, for a lot of those possible scenarios, I don't think we're ready. I don't think we have a good path. I don't think that we could bring somebody in and, and help them be as successful as maybe some of the other potential uh, groups. And that's one of the things that remote work can really solve is it can bring in people of so many different walks of life, so many different types of people to come into your organization and to be successful. Think about someone who has a physical disability, really can't leave their house, but they can do fantastic work. 
they can be at their home and they, uh, they're sharp. They are uh, a wonderful employee. They could be in customer service or sales, but maybe their issue is getting the transportation to get to a place, get to a building. And so you lose out on that potential talent. What about the a person who has uh, kids and uh, doesn't have the childcare they need, hasn't able to, uh, you know, be able to pick their kids up at, at three o'clock, you know, can we offer flexibility to workers that have unique situations and be able to attract talent we never imagined before? This is one of the real kind of silver linings, one of the real uh, surprises that I discovered when taking my company fully remote, that I had could modify things, I could make things work better, and I could attract a larger talent pool uh, to my company. I wasn't uh, stuck on location. I didn't have to hire people in Orange County, California. I didn't, I could hire them anywhere in the world. I didn't have to hire people who had a car. I could hire anybody. I didn't have to hire, you know, someone who was uh, uh, any other particular uh, type of thing, because as long as they had the talent, the desire, maybe the experience to do the job, I could bring them in and make it work. So let's talk about once you bring them in, once you have them in, how do we do that? How do we, how do we help them be successful? Well, as, as, as those mentioned in my, uh, in the intro there, I did write a book, my first book called The Power of Company Culture. Uh, I was really uh, excited to have Marshall Goldsmith, who's a great uh, uh, a thought leader and also Glassdoor kind of really uh, support the book and talk a lot about what they see the best organizations consistently doing was what I had found as well, which is you have to be good at as a company culture, as an organization at transparency, positivity, measurement, uniqueness, recognition, listening, and mistakes. Now, I'm not going to be going, this talk today is not about those specific things, although you'll notice a, a kind of weave in, in, in and out. We're going to talk more specifically about remote work. But it's important if you feel like your organization is pretty terrible at transparency and how to measure things, that's going to be an area that's going to continue to be a problem even if you are remote. You're going to have to work on that. Now, I've had the pleasure, uh, you know, since the pandemic, uh, working with some really top organizations and helping them with their remote work strategies. I'm sure you might recognize a few of these logos. Um, and so this is something that Big Co is thinking about. And this is something, and I also did, you know, worked with another. 60 or so small and medium-sized companies that you maybe haven't heard of that are really trying to get their remote strategies correct. So these are time-tested uh, strategies or key things that we saw over and over and over again, you had to get right first. And I've been able to kind of spread that, that message all, all, all over the world. And I, I, I don't know how it happened. I'll be honest, this was not something I ever intended to do. I have my day job. I'm a CEO of People G2. And uh, but along the way, people just kept asking us to talk about what we were doing and what made us successful and what could they do to learn from that so they could be successful. And I've, I've really enjoyed that, that journey so far. And so my company uh, continues. So when we went uh, remote back in 2009, we had never been written up in a news article. We had never been given an award for best place to work. We had never uh, you know, been recognized really for anything. And once we went remote, and once we started thinking about our company, we started winning awards. And I really attribute this to us changing to a remote company, focusing on our culture and engagement. And then we started growing rapidly, right? Five times Inc.'s 5,000 fastest growing companies. And then, you know, all the attention came. And we, I've just been really feel blessed. And I'm really excited that my team uh, is able to work flexibly and able to work anywhere in the world. Uh, and we really are the better for it. So a quick uh, kind of survey here. Sometimes I do this in the chat, but I know where uh, where this format is. We'll just sort of you can think about it whenever you're, you're watching this. Uh, you know what what kind of return to office do you think is going to happen? And what we're seeing so far in the data is that you know about a third of the people are okay going back. Uh, another almost forty percent say they would like to have an option, right? They do a little bit of both. They could go in some days, stay home some days. Uh, kind of that hybrid model. But another 32% said, no way, they want remote only. And it was a recent McKinsey study that came out that really shows that inside that 32%, that no way, remote only, that your top employees are in that category. So those people that you do not want to lose, your top talent, are 100, they are, we want remote. And they also found that they are totally willing 
to leave. They are preparing to leave already if they're told they have to come back in the office uh, without any flexible plan, without any remote or hybrid work allowed. So it's something your company is really going to have to think about. So what's the, let's get into what the five keys are. And the first key is pretty simple. We need to define what our remote types are. We need to understand what we're talking about when we say a remote company, because it's not the same for everybody. There are a couple different types of remote employees or remote uh, types of people. First is the digital nomad. And for most of you, this may not be what your company is going to be hiring. You may be using them as a freelancer or as a contractor, but the person who wants to live anywhere in the world and sort of is their own entrepreneur and they're working, you know, wherever. They're on the beach in Mexico one day and the next day they're in Poland working in a cafe. Uh, the digital nomad is a someone who, you know, really doesn't have boundaries, uh, can go wherever they want to go. They typically tend to be very entrepreneurial. Again, I don't expect this to be the type of person that you're going to hire. And in fact, for a traditional employee arrangement, I don't even suggest that you consider digital nomads. They might, again, need to be contractors because where their internet is going to come from, from day to day, where they're going to be and all the tax laws and different things, if they continue to move and move and move, it's a complexity that you may not want to deal with. Now, the average uh, work from home is the average type of uh, remote work setting we're talking about. So most of your employees are working from home, but not all remote work is working from home. And when COVID goes away and we are, can get back to quote unquote normal, remote could also be that they're going into a shared office or going into a Regis or a, a work, you know, other sort of workplace type setting. And so they're just not going into a traditional office where everybody else is. So they may have the ability to go into an office that's just where lots of other people go to work, that's also remote. Then we have the part-time side hustle. So you have people that are doing jobs remotely part-time as a side hustle. This is everything from, you know, Postmates and Uber to maybe they have a music or maybe they have a hobby where they're getting paid. Maybe they're doing social media marketing, you know, whatever the sort of side job is, it's not their main job, but you may be hiring some people part-time they may have another job part of the time and then they're working for you part-time. And so remote is a pretty key and a flexible work is a pretty key component for them to be successful. And then of course, offsite and in the field. And this is one that people don't always think about. Your uh, air conditioning repair person, the plumber, the electrician, uh, they are all uh, offsite and in the field and they are remote employees. In fact, they've been remote employees always. They don't have a traditional place where they go. They don't have an office. They don't have a desk. They're, they're in a truck or in a car and they're, they're moving around and their office is whoever's home or whatever business they're visiting at that moment to do the repair or the work or the installation. They are remote workers. So whatever, if you have those types of people in your company, whatever work you're doing right now to help everybody else be remote that maybe it's not usually remote, you need to think about expanding that into them as well. The tools, the communication, all of that will be, really uh, supported at a higher level. And they will really appreciate you and your company far more if you could help bring them into the fold and give them tools and processes for them to be successful, even if, again, their office is being out in the field. And then hybrid. So are you allowing, do you have a workspace? Do you have a, a dedicated desk? Do you have uh, you know, that type of thing for someone, but they have the flexibility to come and go? A lot of companies don't realize this, but we've been doing hybrid for a long time. If you, know, if you as an employee, maybe a manager, are flying to different offices and different locations all week, going to see clients all the time, you know, if you find that you're on the road and out of the quote-unquote office more than you're in it, you're working hybrid anyways. It's just that you go to into that office those few days when you're back. And so those people have better outcomes because they can cut them out of travel, more people are comfortable Zoom and other types of communications. But once they're able to start traveling on a more consistent basis, the team is able to communicate with them in a much organized and, and significant way. Key two is to really define and think about what does tick. To really get into thinking about what will make your employees happy, what will help your employees on a very squishy you know, kind of way. And, and I love to always start with Daniel Pink's work and talk about autonomy, mastery, and purpose. Now, this is important for any employee in any job, but it is extra important 
for remote work. Making sure that people have the autonomy to do their job, if you can, where they want, when they want, how they want, is key. The more autonomy we can give our employees, the happier they are. That we look at studies, when we look at uh, the best places to work consistently, autonomy is something that employees rating their employers very high seem to always have. They all, now, autonomy doesn't mean that you get to walk in one day and just say, I don't want to be in customer service today and tomorrow I'm going to be in sales. So that would mean by autonomy. Autonomy is, you know, you have your job, here's the box you live in, but inside that box, you get it done. You figure, you know, we'll support you with the many different possible ways you might be able to do that job. The next one is mastery. So that's the idea of learning a new skill constantly, you know, going to a conference or learning something new, getting a certification. At, at a lot of companies and for a lot of jobs, that's easy to do. For some jobs, you learn that job pretty quickly and that's your job to sit and do that thing over and over and over and over again. I mean, imagine if you were packing boxes at Amazon, you would probably learn that job pretty quickly and it would be pretty consistent. And that may be what you may really enjoy that and you love that consistency and it's a good job and that's great. But for that person to be happy long-term, they need to have some mastery in their lives somewhere. Could they have it at work? Sure. Can they have it somewhere else outside their life? Maybe learning guitar or learning how to, to, to needlepoint or whatever the, the hobby may be. As long as they have it somewhere, they can be a happy employee. And then finally, purpose. They need to understand what the company's purpose is, be able to articulate it in their own words and be aligned with it. They need to be happy about it. They need to be okay, right? If the company's purpose is contrary to their own life's de destiny, and all their life and what they value, and they can't work there and be happy. Uh, you know, we wouldn't ask a, a vegan to be working in a butcher shop. I mean, this is like, you know, it probably would be some much of a disconnect there. So my company's purpose is to make the world a slightly safer place. We know that the background checks we run will keep sex offenders out of daycares, keep people who've had embezzlement away from having access to your money, but, you know, we're going to make a small benefit to society, one little tiny thing at a time. That's our purpose. And so when people work for us, they, they need to feel that way too. The next thing you need to do is really think about how you're going to deal with performance management. There was a great study that came out last year from Gallup all around performance management and remote employees. And what we found was that if you could re-engineer your performance management to really change the way you're interacting with your employees, that you can have a much better performance management system and that remote work will really accelerate and you can see a big change. So instead of having annual goals that you're talking about, you're more agile and collaborative, right? The goals are collaborative, they change, they move all the time. So you're constantly checking in, setting new goals. You know, it's, it's a regular thing. And my company managers are pretty typically are reviewing goals with their employees and then modifying them and changing them as it makes sense. We're not waiting for an annual meeting. We're having ongoing conversations all the time about feedback, about dialogue, about what's going on on a pretty regular basis, not on a infrequent sort of scheduled quarterly or you know a twice a year type of a thing. And instead of an annual performance review, we actually do them monthly, but companies do at least quarterly is the right thing to do. So you should be having a pretty big check-in at least every quarter. If you're doing this in this kind of way, you will notice that the, the momentum of the organization can move much quicker. And actually your managers will feel less bogged down by this process. You know, the annual goals and the annual performance reviews tend to be pretty much a bogged down process for everybody. And by morphing this into smaller chunks and making it more often, it's more palatable and it's easier for everyone to be happy. The other thing that we found out was that, and this really ties into Marcus Buckingham's book, uh, Nine Lives of Work, is that it, you know really employees don't really want feedback. What they want is attention, right? So in remote work, we're seeing that they want more touches, right? They want more, because we're not all walking around the same office, they need to have more touches. And I really, and I'm gonna talk about this later, suggest that these touches are done in group settings as much as possible. You can't possibly be constantly meeting with everyone one-on-one. -on -one. So working remotely, we want some sort of attention, some sort of 
you know, am I on the right track? Am I going in the right direction? Is the work I'm doing helpful and productive for the company, right? And it's much higher for remote employees. And, and that system you will find is better for the organization as a whole. Key three is creating measurement and flow. So what do I mean by that? Well, I talked to you about ditching the uh, annual survey, uh, the annual goals, but another thing you can do is, you know, when you ditch the annual survey overall, to change it to a weekly survey. Imagine if you asked one question every week. Now, I don't do every week, I probably do 48 weeks, but I get 48 questions answered by my employees. Now, if your company is gigantic, you might wanna do this at a, at a uh, team level or a division level, uh, something that's palatable, right? You, you can't survey 600 people and then have one person trying to, to look through 600 survey responses every week. So it has to be in, in, this, in groups of maybe 30 to 50. But if you ask a group of people questions, one question every week, they're gonna respond in the high 90 percentile. And then over the course of a year, you're gonna have had constant attention, constant feedback, constant chances to make changes in your organization based on what you're hearing from your people. Instead of only asking them once a year, taking months and months and months to try to figure out what they said, months and months again, try to figure out what to do about it. And by then they've either left or they've got new problems. I wanna make sure we're judging them on impact, right? So measuring what matters. Do you have clear goals, clear KPIs, clear outcomes, clear understanding between you and your employees about what's expected of them, what good looks like, uh, what, what, what really matters from an impact standpoint? And then again, making those changes, constantly changing. You know, you can, you can set a goal with a salesperson this month and then, geez, a bunch of, you know, great things happen and we might make adjustments to that. Or, you know, suddenly opportunities dry up and so the goals may change so they can be more impactful. Remember to celebrate wins and say thank you. So it's sometimes a little bit difficult in remote settings because we're used to at an office, just having someone stand up and everyone cheers for them if they did something good or to sing them happy birthday or whatever. And so we have to be a little bit more intentional about where we celebrate and how we say thank you. At my organization, People G2, we use a water cooler room in Slack and that's where we say thank you. That's also where we talk about anything that's work appropriate. But it's our place to go in and say, hey, today Tom did this amazing thing for me. Or I noticed that you know, uh, Sally really went the extra mile for this client, got them happy again. You know, and that's where we thank each other and we, we celebrate our wins and, and, and it can be seen publicly there. That's our, our place to do it. We also want to talk, continue to talk about how work will be different going forward. So if you're planning on staying remote, if you're planning on bringing everyone back to the office, if you're planning on some sort of a hybrid model, you need to really be talking to your people about this. And I, I don't mean talking to the point where they tell you what they want and then you ignore them and do whatever you wanted. We need to be talking about this and really getting agreement and really making sure that everyone understands and is willing to move forward in the plan that has come up by the, by the company. Because again, remember that early study uh, that I mentioned uh, that uh, McKenzie did, your best people are getting ready to leave if they're not gonna be given flexible work. Because people have realized that sitting in traffic for two hours living in very expensive places, uh, being able to go pick up their kid from school and then come back and just keep working it, are things they care about, are things that are really important that make a huge difference in their lives, right? And how much more they get to see their families, how much more time they get to spend getting things done and not, and not be you know, wasting time doing things, being able to save money and you know, make lunch at home every day. I mean, there are so many benefits that our employees have, have picked up on. Key four is to say yes, is to make sure that we are being positive leaders. So if we are in the mindset of saying no to things, that any idea someone gives us, it's gonna be a no, or uh, somewhat negative, and we're gonna put up barriers for people. Uh, I think one of the best benefits of being a remote company is the way you start to feel progressive. You start to feel like you can do anything because you have so many more options on how you might be able to get it done. Back in 2018, I decided that the entire year I was going to say yes to every question that was answered asked of me. Now, there's a lot of funny movies about this. Shonda Rhimes wrote a book called The Year of Yes. It's a great book. I suggest reading it. 
And it was really from that that I got this idea that, you know what, for the whole year, I'm going to say yes. And I was shocked at how many doors open, how many opportunities, how many wonderful ideas that my employees had when I said yes. Now, you can say yes and. I can say yes, but. There are ways to protect myself, right? And I certainly wouldn't walk around telling everyone, hey, guess what? I'm going to say yes to everything that's ever asked of me. But people, when they know you're going to say yes, they know that you're going to try, that you're going to give this an idea a go, that you're going to listen to them, that we're going to try to find a way to make something happen, to explore it, to think about it, right? That it is contagious in your organization. You, you, you want to do a work, different work schedule this week? Sure. Let's figure out how we can make that happen. How will you communicate with your team? What are the things we need to worry about or, or to do, you know? You want to take vacation? Yes. You want, you want to raise? Yes. Yes. But here are the five things that we talked about that you have to do in order to qualify for that raise, right? You can say yes over and over and over again. If we can change our mindset to think about that. Now, the second part of this in the positive leadership standpoint is for us to focus on what's working, okay? So to ask this question of what is good, what is working? And that we need to celebrate that, talk about that, focus on that. So the example I have is if you have 10 salespeople and two of them are killing it, they're doing an awesome job, they're totally bypassed their quota, and you got, you know, maybe six people that are just doing okay, and you got two that are really struggling, okay? Most people go and worry about the two people that are struggling and they're taught and, and, and focusing on them. And everyone else has to sit in a meeting and listen to what, why are these people bad and why aren't they getting their job done and all, all these different types of things. Instead, we should be focusing on those two people that are killing it and be asking them, what are you doing? How are you doing it? Can you, can you teach everyone else? right? And celebrating their wins and, and trying to learn from what they're doing, right? What's positive, what's working and taking that information and sharing it with everybody else. Because there are so many good things. You may find out that those two salespeople consistently send video messages. You may find that they always make their calls after hours because they can actually reach somebody. Um, there's maybe you're going to find some trick, something that's helping them be successful. Maybe it's just that they make more calls or they send more emails or they send out more proposals. Maybe they go to more shows, whatever it is. By focusing on the good, we can discover far more to help everybody else. And it doesn't mean that we may not have to fire those two people if they can't you know, meet our expectations uh, after a while. But we, again, wanna make sure we can share with them what is working, what is the path to them being successful and be very clear about that and see what happens. 99% of the time when I do that, it is a good thing. And we see people really progressing. We get out of that mode of thinking we're going to have to fire them into the mode of, wow, they're really doing great now, right? And, and how do we continue to support them and help them be successful? The, uh, the next uh, sort of key, as we're kind of getting down here, well, uh, is, is to get into our, our better meetings area. And there's some really... Uh, specific things that I hope that anyone watching this uh, will really uh, think about doing. We have all these meetings. And what I'm finding when I talk to my clients, when I do a lot of consulting work around remote work and culture and meetings for companies, is that they're doing a lot of consistent meetings that are the same over and over and over again. They always have a one hour meeting. They always have a 30 minute meeting. They their boss has them on a two hours every morning on the meeting. That's just sort of open-ended, right? And that, that's not great. Uh, we're going to do another session here in a few weeks uh, with Business Insider, and we're going to talk a lot more about those specific meetings you can do. But I want to give a few tricks today. The first one is to slow down and connect in any meeting that is 30 minutes or more. Okay, this is super important. So how do you do that? Well, the first thing we do is we go around the room and we ask everyone, how are you showing up today? How are you showing up for this meeting? Now, you only have to do this once a day. If you're on meetings with the same people over and over again, you would just do it once in a day on average. Um, you could do it more. But when you ask people how they're showing up, they may be smiling. And they may say everything, look like everything's great. But deep down inside, they may be frustrated or sad or upset. And so you'll get people that will say, 
yeah, I'm okay, but you know, I have a newborn at home and I really haven't slept in like three days. I'm kind of struggling. Or I just found out that my grandmother's in the hospital or I had to put, we had to put our dog down this morning. I mean, like you may suddenly just find out this person's really struggling. That is a fantastic opportunity for you as the leader, whether it's the, because you're the most senior person or maybe you're the group leader to stop and give that person support. Or if that's not appropriate, then to cancel the meeting. If, if we can't move forward and this person is really struggling, let's just postpone this meeting. We'll have it another time. Or if the meeting really has to happen, but you don't need that person right now, excuse that person. Say, you know, I can see you're struggling. I know you're really tired. Why don't you go t- take this 30 minutes just to go and, and relax and, and, and get your head straight and do whatever you need to do to, you know, kind of feel a little bit better. And we'll handle the meeting. We'll send you a, a notes of whatever we came up with and fill you in later. People can't just push through these things if they're struggling. So this is a really good opportunity to make sure that people are okay and they're ready to move forward. We often just say, how's everyone doing? Everyone gives you the obligatory, yeah, doing great. And then we push through and they are not ready to have that meeting and they they sabotage it. They aren't listening. Uh, We don't get good outcomes. They're not ready to give you great ideas. So this is a really key way. Now, at the end of the meeting, we're going to ask everyone to go around the room again, and we're going to say, how are you leaving this meeting? They tend to answer this question a bit more as the employee. So they might say, wow, this was a great meeting. I didn't really understand what we were doing before, but now I really get it. Wow, okay, this is cool. Or they might say, yeah, I know this. uh, we did this meeting, but I don't think the client's going to go for this. I'm really nervous. I think this client's going to be upset. Uh, you know, really, I'm not happy. So you as the leader of this meeting might realize that there's some tension. There's some unresolved issues. There's some questions still. Do we, maybe we need another meeting. Maybe we need to think through how we're going to deliver this solution to the client. Maybe we need to bring somebody else in who can help us. When we just leave and we assume that everyone thinks the way we think, that everyone's on the same page, it, rarely is everybody on the same page. Rarely did everyone have the same meeting. And so this is really key information because this is what helps you decide what to do next. Do I need to go work with that one person who was struggling? Do I need to have another meeting? Do I need to get help from somewhere else? Well, how can I get this group of people moving forward in a positive way, in a better way uh, before, before we get stuck here? And then the caveat to all of this is that if you're the most senior person in the room or in the meeting, you need to let them go first. So if uh, as me as a CEO of my company, I would, I would be the absolute last person to go. And if let's say the VP of sales was in this meeting, he would go next to last. Because if I show up and say, ah, oh, I'm just so excited, I'm so happy that life is, couldn't be better. No one's gonna share anything difficult. If I show up and say, I've got all these horrible, difficult things going on. No one's going to be willing to share anything good or, or wonderful. They're all going to feel like, well, I can't really tell, you know, Chris that I just, you know, I'm really happy right now because, uh, you know, w- whatever the new thing is. So let them go first. And again, if you get caught somewhere and someone's struggling, then we stop. You don't, as the leader, get to share, right? It doesn't matter. We need to deal with where that person's at you find that this over time, this kind of connection, this kind of checking in, it's just, it's like magic. I don't know how to better describe it. It's like magic. People just, they're willing to share. They're willing to talk. They're willing to argue. They're willing to to be vulnerable and open because they know you care about them. And they know that if they're struggling, you're going to be there to help them. And, and, And the last part is that as a group, you can help people. We don't have to be stuck one-on-one as the manager having to be their therapist or having to be the person that solves all their problems. You know, four or five, six heads are better than one. And so when someone says they're struggling about something, you have several people there to help you, to help support that person. The other thing we want to do in remote and or hybrid uh, scenarios is to try to stop having one-on-one meetings. I'm going to talk in a minute about signposts, but you know, when you're in a traditional office and you see Tom go into Jane's office and you know they had to talk before you could go talk to Jane about the next part of the project, there's a clear, you can see they had a meeting. And now you know it's your turn to go have that and your next meeting. Well, that doesn't happen when we're remote. When we're all at home, we're not seeing some of that movement. 
So we're better off having meetings with groups of people. So ask yourself, should, would anyone else be impacted by this meeting? Would anybody else do well to be here? Would they learn anything? Would they um, you know, possibly have input or they were, are gonna be impacted by the outcome? They should be in the meeting. If you have a one-on-one -on -one with Tom and then you gotta have a one-on-one -on -one with Jane and a one-on-one -on -one with Jace, I mean, you're, it's slow, it's time-wasting and the information just doesn't move quickly. Of course, there are meetings that have to be one-on-one -on -one. or you might ask yourself, should anybody else be in this meeting? And if you're like, oh no, this is kind of an HR, clearly, yeah, okay, it is a one-on-one -on -one meeting or this is about their goals specifically. No, no one else should be in this meeting, of course. But most meetings in a remote and hybrid situation should be groups should be five to seven people so that we can move information, get better ideas uh, and, and make sure that we don't have to continue to have meetings about meetings about meetings just to finally have a meeting to get something done. That, that, that's a waste. I wanna stop having long videos on, on uh, whatever platform you're using. Being on video is tiring. It's effective, it's very good. Seeing people smile, seeing their face brings us joy in the beginning, but seeing our own face and people for too long starts to become a tiring exercise. So if we wanna stop having these long video meetings, we wanna instead have short meetings. So we have, uh, I told you I'm gonna to talk to you about these different meeting types next time, but we have something like 35 of these small little meetings we call cockroach meetings that are you know, 15 minutes long. And not, 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 nobody's on all of those. These are all different people inside the organization meeting at different times but it allows five to seven people to quickly get on, solve one issue, and then get off the phone. One item agenda, one small issue, one thing, and that's it. There's no chit chat, there's no checking in, there's no bonding exercise. It's just, hey, does anyone know how to do this thing? Can you guys help me? Oh yeah, yeah, here's how you do it, okay. Uh, oh, a client asked me how to do this thing. Oh yeah, we had that happen before. This is what we did, but you're probably gonna need Chris to get that proof on that. I mean, they can move quickly. When you have long, long meetings, we begin to just fill it up full of junk because, well, there's an hour scheduled on my calendar for this, I guess we're gonna meet for an hour, right? We have naturally just start pulling in all sorts of other things and it's, it's a time waster. And then we really wanna curate our meetings. So one of the simple ways you can curate your meetings is to make sure they always start on time. My organization, if you're more than a minute late, if you come in at, the meeting was at two and you come in at 2.02, you have to sing. If you're a good singer, we might give you terrible poetry. But you got to sing a song or, you know, and it's, it's meant as a funny thing. It's meant as, you know, it's, it's not, we're not trying to be mean to anybody, but it's a funny, oh, you got to sing and everyone starts cheering and, you know, and then that person's not ever late again. We, have, we do not have a problem with people being late because we know we start meetings on time. It also sends the message that everyone's time is valuable. If you're the leader and you come in three, four, five minutes late, I mean, you're sending the message that your time is more important than theirs, the message that you're disorganized and you can't keep your calendar straight. Uh, you're also sending the message that you're kind of kind of stupid because you just wasted all that company money. All those people were just sitting there waiting for you to show up. You're paying them, right? So start meetings on time and always try to end your meetings early. There's a thing called Parkinson's law, which says that if you fill if you, if you set amount of time to do something, you tend to fill it. So if you say, I have two hours to clean the garage this weekend, you will probably move at a speed and get about two hours of work done. If you said, I only have 30 minutes to do that same amount of work, you would move faster. You might ask for help. You might bring your family or your neighbors or get someone to come in and help. You know, if you condense that time, you find ways to get it done quickly. And if you Set the goal to end early. It's not to do that thing for that whole time. Your goal is to end. It's not like exercise where you're going to you know, exercise for 30 minutes. It says, hey, I have a job to do. Can I get this job done quickly? So setting a goal to end early will always help your meetings be more successful because everyone will move quickly. Everyone will be more precise. Everyone will know we don't have to be on this call for 30 minutes just because it's set for 30 minutes. I have work to do. Can we get it done in 15? Can we get it done in 20? Whatever that may be. And no agenda, no meeting. If you get a meeting request and there's not an agenda inside of it, you should decline it every time. That should be a company rule. If there's not an agenda, even if it's a single item, if I don't know why we're meeting and I don't know what's expected of me and I, I, and I can't prepare, there's nothing worse than showing up to a meeting 
And they go, well, yeah, we're going to need to review this report so we can make a decision about our marketing budget. And you go, oh, yeah, well, I haven't looked at the report yet. Oh, you haven't? Okay, well, yeah, go look at that report, then we'll have another meeting. Well, we just wasted all that time having a meeting. If I had known by looking at the agenda, I could have reviewed that report in advance, shown up to that meeting, been prepared, and we moved on very quickly. These are the small ways that we help our employees be successful, to be happy, to uh, uh, re remove the annoyances of work by helping people be more efficient. And then we want to create signposts. This is sort of the last little uh, thing that are super important inside of organizations in general, but of remote and hybrid organizations. You need to determine when is it we check in? Is that a standing Monday morning meeting at 9 a.m.? Is that a, you know, when, once a day occurrence, but it's random? Is that as we need it? Is that once a month? When does you, your team check in with you? If you're, if you're the manager, right? Or if you're not the manager, when is it you're supposed to check in with your manager? Do you know what is that? Do you have a, do you have that kind of figured out? Again, in remote companies, we don't have the, I walk in the door and I go to the lunchroom and get coffee and put my lunch in the fridge and see my boss. And we sort of check in right informally. We don't have that anymore. We don't also don't have that horrible commute, but now we need to replace that check-in somehow. When is that going to be? When does that occur? Just define it. When do we collaborate? When is the team going to get together and collaborate and discuss things, make changes, alterations, bring in new conversations we've had with clients and, and vendors? And, you know, when are we going to collaborate? That's different than checking in. So like my sales team knows that they get together for an hour, they have an hour long collaboration meeting every Monday morning, they've got it. And that's, that's when they do that. They have additional check-ins throughout the week, but they have a collaboration point right? Where they solve issues. Geez, I, where, where do I find the pricing for this? And uh, where, where do I find out, get the tech specs for the integration that this client wants, right? That's when they collaborate. When do we brainstorm, right? So when do we think about new ideas? When do we get innovative? Do you have that plan? Do you have that idea? Do you have that, you know, going? If you've not planned it, if you've not asked your people to come together and to be clever and to think about new solutions, they're not probably going to do it very often. So have a, have a Friday, you know, like a Friday brainstorm. Or maybe, maybe it's every week, maybe it's every month, whatever makes sense for your organization. But bringing people together with the intent of being creative and coming up with new ideas and brainstorming gives them the indication of what we want from them, right? And then we're also setting up the environment to listen, the environment for them to bring in their good ideas because we've set a time for it. When do we blow off steam? And, and do in sub questions, do you even need to, right? Your organization might say, that's not something we do here. They can do that in their own time, fine, right? But some people say, yeah, we really need that team building time. Maybe we're gonna have a Friday afternoon cocktail hour. Maybe we're gonna have a Monday morning bagels and coffee, you know, where we talk about stuff. Maybe it's a Wednesday, maybe it's a hump day, you know, whatever coffee at three, but we bring your group together and that's when we can chit chat and talk about our week and that terrible call we had or, you know, whatever, just to kind of blow off steam and connect as, as people. If you, if you can create some of these little environments, right? If you can bring these things together on a more intentional basis for your team, for your company, remote work just, it becomes so powerful, becomes so creative and constructive and it, it just your people will find solutions to things that for years have eluded you and you can also think about when do we and you can fill in the blank right what other types of specific meetings are important for you you know when do we budget when do we spend the money when do we approve expenses when do we whatever these important items are for your you and your team right when do we meet as a company Everyone is on one big call and we meet and we talk, right? So whatever those other important things are, create those. Ask your people what are the ones that they think are important. What would they like to see? They'll have some great ideas. And if you could put these things in place, you can have an amazing remote company, hybrid company, flexible work, and take advantage of so many of the different parts of remote work. Now, there's a lot more to it than this. Uh, the good news is, 
I have an entire remote course. If you're interested in that, anyone who's watching this can get a discount 50% off by going to my website, uh, chrisdyer.com, and you can use that CD50 code. Uh, I also have, as I mentioned earlier, a new book coming out. And up until May 25th, if you're interested in buying maybe uh, multiple copies, you can go to this website and get a massive discount off the cover price. And you also get stuff from 50 other companies for free. You get free and discounted services to help your remote organization. A full list is on that website. Uh, I think if you buy like 10 books, you're getting $28,000 in free stuff. It's that kind of crazy. So uh, if it's after, if you're seeing this afterwards, that's okay. You can buy the book wherever you find your books online. And um, thank you. I'm really happy, happy to be here and appreciate uh, you, uh, Business Insider having me here today. And hopefully this helped uh, those of you watching with your remote employees, your remote company, and you can make this strategy work for you. Chris, incredible and very insightful presentation on a new reality that we're all experiencing, which is the fact that pants are indeed optional. <laughs> Re remote work right is here to stay to one extent or another, depending of course on the industry, the location and type of work, right? And thank you for sharing with us so much the five secrets to remote success. We all have to deal with remote work and whether we like it or not, we might as well make the most out of it. Right. Give, given that these are certain challenges, right, that we may be faced with in relation to working remotely, again, depending on the situation, making sure that we address these five key areas and components can make our remote work more efficient, more effective and more successful. Chris, if I could ask you a question, if you were to rank these five steps, these five keys by importance of them, needing to be addressed to enable for the success of remote work, how would you go about doing that? Some people may be able to address them all. Some may not be able to do that. Which steps do you think that someone should focus on in any case? Yeah, I think if someone said, I can only do one of the things, which one should I do? I would say to curate your meetings, that whole part about meetings and making them, you know, when do you check in and having, you know, very strict rules about you start on time, we end early, you know, uh, really coming up with the rules of how we meet as an organization is so key for remote work. Because if you're just stuck being on these open-ended long calls that don't have any purpose, people check out, they leave. I mean, it just, no one likes sitting on a two-hour meeting listening to your boss talk to themselves for no reason and you can't get your work done, right? So we have to be effective in how we, how we meet. Meetings should be a good thing, right? They should be, you should be happy that someone called a meeting, not like, oh, not another meeting, right? For sure. And maybe this is something for another session, but you spoke about company culture and briefly about the seven pillars that need to be in place to ensure a solid organizational culture. Would you be able to share a, a few thoughts about how a corporate environment, a com company culture, and these seven pillars are expected to be transformed by this new reality of even partly working remotely. Yeah, so I mean, the seven pillars are the things that we discovered through a lot of research that all of the best companies with the best cultures, they are consistently good at those seven things, right? That's a fun, fun, fundamental. So usually what I do is I, I challenge people to go back and rank themselves. Where are they, where do they think they're good and where do they think they're struggling? And ask our people to anonymously rank them, right? Where, where, are, we, where are we doing? And usually two or three they're good at, and the and one or two they're okay, and then they got two or three that they're terrible at. And usually transparency people are pretty terrible at. If you're not getting, not being recognized as the best place to work, if you're struggling to keep your talent, transparency always comes up. And, and transparency is like, do you share goals? Do you share your profit and loss statement? Does everyone know what you know, right? Can you be as transparent as possible? Because then people know why you made the decision you made. Now people can make better decisions because they know what you know, right? If, if, I, if I were to walk down the hall and I, and I didn't smile at you and I kind of gave you a weird look and I walked down the hall, you might say, oh, Chris is mad at me. But if you knew that I just, I just found out that my grandmother passed away and, and a, a dog just bit, like if you have more information, you may like, oh, Chris is, there's something wrong with Chris. He needs help. You didn't think it was about you. But if you don't know anything, people internalize and they go, oh, this bad thing that's happening must be, they don't like me. Um, I'm in trouble. The company's in trouble, right? So the more transparent we are, 
that can fill in the blanks with good information and make better guesses and better estimations instead of just going to the worst case scenario. Absolutely. And transparency is super, super important in all areas of life. And we should definitely make sure that it exists also in an organizational environment. Chris, thank you very much once again for your time, your participation, your presentation as part of Leading Entrepreneurs of the World. We are very, very excited to get our hands on your new book. And thank you for extending that discount for, for everybody watching. Uh, and we look forward to your upcoming book presentation on remote work again here at One Business World's Leading Entrepreneurs of the World. Thank you and talk to you again soon. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Bye-bye.